Hello. We're going to be uh, we're going to begin here. Uh, my name is Carl Schleen. I'm the mayor of Lewiston. And before we get started, I'm pleased to introduce Catherine Weber, who is the lending services librarian and this evening's deputy mayor. <laughs> she will say a few words about the library in this beautiful space. Thank you very much, and thank you all so much for coming. As the mayor stated, I'm Catherine, the Lending Services Librarian here at the Lewiston Public Library. Just wanted to thank you all for coming out to the space tonight. Um, if you need facilities, they are just down this hallway through the double doors. Uh, emergency exit, same way, down the stairwell. Please don't try to take the elevator, which is to the left. It will be locked, and you won't be able to get down. But in case you need to leave the building in a hurry, I think that's all the announcements that I have. Thank you again so much for coming and joining us tonight. I, I really appreciate the library hosting us this evening. Uh, yes, thank you for coming to our commercial real estate public forum. This is the first public forum for the Mayoral Ad Hoc Economic Development Committee. I co-chair this committee with tonight's moderator, Mark Lee, from Harriman Associates. There has been incredible investment in Lewiston recently, and this forum represents a chance to have a conversation with a few developers that have been a part of moving Lewiston forward. We'll be saving time for audience questions at the end. You'll notice uh, there's a, uh, a basket with uh, some paper and some pens, so um, you can either raise your hand and myself and Catherine will uh, bring you some paper, or you can just uh, uh, walk back there and fill out a question, and if there are questions, we will um, you know, get to them at the end. Uh, I'm grateful that our panelists have joined us this evening, uh, and they'll be introducing themselves uh, here in a little bit. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark Lee. Great, thank you very much. Hopefully you can all uh, hear me. I understand the microphones can be a little fussy here, so do our best. This feels really too formal for what we're gonna try to accomplish here tonight. Uh, and that is really a, an informal conversation with some folks that have uh, stepped up, made investments in the city of Lewiston, uh, as well as some invited guests that can share some stories about ideas for economic uh, development and investment in our city and uh, in the region. Uh, also, we're uh, pleased to have with us um, uh, the, and I'll, Misty, I'll get the title wrong, I'm sure, here, uh, but uh, we have uh, staff from the city of Lewiston in the economic development uh, department as well, uh, and uh, we're delighted to have all of you with us. We'll start, as uh, the mayor mentioned, by having an introduction of their panelists here, and, and we'll start with, uh, to my right, uh, Go ahead, Misty Parker. Do you have a <laughs> microphone or? So I do have this. Oh. I'm Todd. Ah, all right. Do we have assistance technically on the microphone? Oh, let's see what's back there. I was wondering if this is better. Can you just put your phone as far as you can see? Okay. Good evening, my name is Misty Parker. I'm the Assistant Director of Economic and Community Development here for the city. I'm Tom Platts, uh, an architect in Lewiston-Auburn uh, and also do some development work in Lewiston-Auburn. Hi everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, happy to be here in Lewiston. Um, my name is Jim Brady, I'm with Fathom Companies. We're based in Portland commercial real estate developer, mostly doing hospitality, but uh, also now branching into some more residential, and we've also done a fair amount of office space as well, and excited to be here with you tonight. Hi, good evening. Uh, Matt Asia with Chinberg Properties. Um, my title is Director of Asset Management, which I'm sure we'll explain later what that means, but we're a New Hampshire-based development firm uh, that builds, uh, develops, and manages on our own account and we have uh, two large mills here in Lewiston that we're excited to uh, have an opportunity to invest and develop. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name's Paul Urenic. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Real Estate Development for Colby College in Waterville. Um, I've been in that position for six years now and prior to that for 30 years I was with the Bolas Company in Portland as uh, Director of Project Management. Excellent, thank you very, very much, and thank you uh, for uh, joining with us tonight. Uh, we'll start off with uh, some questions to some of the newcomers to our community, uh, and 
And so uh, our first question to, we'll start with, with Matt, if that's all right. Um, Matt, why did Chinberg, yeah, there we go. See, <laughs> put you right on the hot seat here. Why did, why did Chinberg uh, choose to uh, purchase property in, in Lewiston? Well, if, if uh, Eric Chinberg couldn't make it tonight, he's traveling, so he couldn't make it, I think he'd say that he has a passion for mill buildings and a passion for mill towns. And uh, his first mill rehab project was in 1996, and he's probably done 20 since then. Um, and and uh, the mills that, that we purchased in 2018 are a Continental Mill, which is on Cedar Street along the river there. It's, it's a beautiful property, a beautiful location. Uh, and uh, we're, we know there's potential. Um, and so th those are the projects that we look forward to. And I'd also like to add that we, we one of my notes talks about working in many towns and there every, as Paul was speaking to us privately earlier, every, there are many towns and many boards and many cultures and many communities that you have to work in. You have to learn how to uh, figure out which ones are gonna be receptive to, to development. Our focus is mostly uh, market rate residential. Uh, we also have about a million square feet of commercial space within the mills. So we have found in our short time here in Lewiston that the city has a real can-do attitude uh, ab about helping uh, us carpet baggers from <laughs> New Hampshire <laughs> uh, work, in, work in the city. So it's been, it's been a great introduction. Yeah, th thank you, Matt. We, we don't discriminate anyone south of the border here, so this is friendly <laughs> territory. Uh, Jim, I'll, I'll turn to you as well, who's someone who's done a lot of, of uh, development in and around the Portland area. Uh, what attracted you uh, to purchase in Lewiston, Jim? Well, um, a couple of things, actually. One was that we love to do projects that um, are a little more complex, um, particularly like historic tax credit type projects or historic renovation of buildings. Um, and obviously, there's a fair amount of that inventory here. Uh, Matt uh, here obviously far outpaced us with something that's about, what, 500,000 square feet? <laughs> uh, I think we, we, we acquired the Dominican block um, here on Lincoln Street, which is I think something more like 23,000 square feet. So it's actually quite a small building. Uh, however, I like to see an opportunity like that where it's a, a beautiful landmark building that's really unique that I think will have value long term uh, we're, our plan is to convert that building to residential on the upper floors uh, with some retail on the ground floor. Um, so I hadn't really spent much time looking at the Lewiston market. As you said, I've done most of my development in the, in the Portland community, having de developed several, three hotels in downtown Portland uh, over the years. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Press Hotel, which was a historic tax credit rehab project that we did there. Um, and most recently opened a new hotel on Commercial Street called Canopy that opened last uh, season, which everybody told us we were crazy to continue building that when COVID started. But as it turns out, it's okay. <laughs> I think we're all gonna come out of it fine. Uh, but no, I, I've been here a few times for some build main events. Um, I've obviously have seen the unique inventory of these beautiful historic buildings. And you know, I look at places like this where you've got, you know, Bates University nearby, you've got a wonderful uh, healthcare facility nearby, a lot of mill space, which has the advantages of using historic tax credits to be able to uh, grow businesses so that industry and, and offices can continue to flourish. And so I just see that together combined with the river uh, is, as a great amenity and a place that will long-term continue to grow and, and be a nice place to be invested in. Excellent. Th thank you very much. Uh, and uh, speaking of, of old mill buildings and uh, our veteran on the panel here uh, with the investment in, in Lewiston, uh, Tom, um, your, your journey uh, through the, the uh, uh, investment uh, opportunities that you've seen in, in Lewiston, maybe share a little bit of the history of that uh, sure. what, what attracted mean, you to for that. For us, I think it was mostly about it's, this is our community. And we believed in um, kind of bringing it back. I grew up here when it was. Uh, the center of Maine. Most of the commerce and retail was all done here. And I looked at these old mills and um, actually we started doing some development before the mills, but certainly with the mills uh, just standing empty and being ready to be torn down seemed to be a shame. And it looked like a, an opportunity more for the city than it did for us. Um, I think it still is. We're getting there, um, but we still have a long ways to go. And I think uh, Really, for us, it is. It's all about community. It's getting the community engaged. It's about 
uh, bringing the city back to what it was back in the 50s. And uh, we're halfway there. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the uh, the next, next uh, question is really kind of a two-part question. And following up, now, now that you've got uh, an investment in and, y and you folks have taken the plunge uh, to really uh, to be a part of our community. Uh, what, um, what is it that the, the city can do uh, to attract more investment uh, that uh, uh, would help uh, not only uh, all of us in the, in the community but also help, help you in thinking about the in, uh, investments that you folks have made? So what is it that the city of Lewiston, and we think about the city uh, writ large, the uh, city staff departments, uh, what is it that they can do to, to uh, continue to, to make Lewiston an attractive place? And, and uh, I'll start, uh, I guess, with, um, with Tom uh, again here. Uh, well, surprisingly, actually, I, I'm wouldn't, I won't be talking about development. I think the city is always best at doing what the city does best, and that's running the community and providing services for the community. I think probably, the, for me, the most important draw to a city is their educational facilities. Um, I would encourage the city to dump every cent they can into their school system. Uh, it's, I mean, it's no accident when you see Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth and all these communities drawing all the professionals live there, and all the professionals who work in this town live there. Um, and we need to draw those people here. I think it draws uh, high-end buildings, high-end housing. It'll increase your tax base. Um, and, and people will want to live here. If the community draws people here, I don't think you have to worry. We'll all come here and develop. That, that, that's, they don't have to do too much to get us to develop here. I mean, we just need the people to want to be here. So I really encourage the city to do everything they can to make this a place where especially young people want to come live, raise their children, and send them to school here. So that's probably my biggest... Uh, biggest thing I would like to see them do. So Jake, I think we'll be uh, appreciative of the plug for more investment in education in the, in the community. Uh, superintendent, so thank you very much. Uh, turning, uh, Matt, to, to you, uh, are there communities that you've made an investment in similar to Lewiston, uh, and, um, and what is it that those communities did to, to really uh, roll open uh, the welcome mat for, for you folks? said and, and education is certainly very important um, I think I look at Kennedy Park and I see how beautifully maintained that is and, uh, and how lovely downtown is um, I look at the park along the river which is a name I don't know but those kind of amenities uh, are places that our residents love to enjoy and we love to be knitted to in a downtown um, we're fortunate most of our projects are in downtowns because historically the mills were built in the center of town and around the town was where commerce was. So being able to walk out your door and to enjoy a well-maintained sidewalk, to enjoy a beautiful park that's around the corner um, uh, is, is a wonderful amenity. Uh, and I think so seeing cities that make those types of investments certainly helps us feel confident that we're, we're making the right choice to in invest in our community. The, uh, the next uh, kind of pivoting from, from Matt's comments and Tom's, uh, Jim, uh, in looking at uh, the, your development, and you said it's been primarily and, and a lot of uh, residential, uh, what is it uh, beyond education that will attract uh, a, a vibrant residential market that can support more development? Well, um, you know, certainly agree with uh, Tom and Matt's comments on the investments in the community and, you know, from an educational and, and outdoor public um, amenities, which are fabulous. One of the things that I think is really critical is, is a predictable environment uh, from a political perspective. And that has actually become something that is forcing developers out of the city of Portland these days uh, due to the unpredictability and the challenges of getting permitted. Um, and whether or not you want to take the risk of investing significant sums of money on a project that may or may not even get approved, depending on how the wind might blow on a particular day at the city council or the planning board. So um, I, I think communities surrounding Portland 
um, are really benefiting from the fact that Portland is kind of uh, tripping over itself a little bit these days with its own successes. Um, but at the end of the day, developers will go where the market is. Um, you've got people that are obviously invested in this community here, and I'm kind of a newcomer to it, but I'm a newcomer to it because I see an opportunity. And at the end of the day, real estate investors are looking to try to make a yield, to make a return on their investment, and they're going to chase where that yield is. So if you can generate the jobs that are here and the demand for the housing, the demand for the office spaces and the retail spaces, then ultimately the developers will follow that because at the end of the day, they're all trying to, to make a decent return, a risk-adjusted return on their investment. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, I told Paul that I wasn't going to uh, throw him any hard, hard questions here uh, tonight, so uh, he, he's, had, he's had the easiest part so far here. But uh, uh, one of the things uh, we're all anxious to know is, is sort of what, what can be a catalyst uh, for uh, development beyond beyond simple uh, market forces, and and so sometimes there's synergies when multiple parties come together. Uh, Paul, I wondered if you might share a little bit of the partnerships that uh, you've uh, been a party to and, and witnessed in the Waterville community to help catalyze development in that downtown. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm in a I'm in a little bit of a not a little bit. I'm in a uh, a lot different position than these gentlemen are here um, working for the college. Um, but the college, um, Colby being in Waterville, I think is similar in a lot of ways to Lewiston, being a mill town, um, being a town where historically all of the jobs that were in the mills, you know, and I guess starting in the 70s right up through, the, you know, the 90s, early 2000s, you know, went overseas, et cetera. Um, and um, and really lost their industrial base. Um, <clears throat> so when so when you know Colby got a new president uh, about six seven years ago, and you know the the campus was doing fine, everything was doing fine, but he looked at the downtown, and he you know and and the downtown was hurting. Um, so you know similar to what. Tom was saying what, and, and what Jim was saying uh, about what are those things that encourage development, you know, bring, you know, educational system, parks, recreation. So what we did in Waterville is we, um, we really put together a group of stakeholders, uh, you know, all the powers to be in the city, residents just as yourself, held several charrettes over about a year-long process, no different than what this is right here. And we, when, when we looked at, you know, what are the strengths of the Waterville area um, and what are the weaknesses and what can we do to build upon those strengths and, 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 and how do we address those, those weaknesses. And, um, and and, and where Waterville was fortunate, was very fortunate, is that you need somebody to step forward uh, sometimes to make those investments that's going to be a lost leader. Um, the, the, the investments that the college has made in downtown Waterville I'm, I'm in the past six years, just our own investments have been about $90 million. Um, I can tell you, none of those investments make money. None of these three gentlemen here would ever do any of those investments. Um, however, um, when, when, when you have people that love a city and you have benefactors in a city and you can go to those people and you can get them people or are people what we call have patient money, can make investments and are willing to wait, um, several years before they see a return on that investment, you know, call it social capital, um, whatever. When you make those investments, what the hope is, is that those investments attract other investments. And that's exactly what has happened in Waterville. The college has put the money forward. Um, and, um, and what we've seen, we've seen a lot of building change hands. We've seen people investing in buildings now. Um, you know, we looked at, we, we identified, as I said, the strengths and weaknesses of the city and we, and we 
very specifically did certain things. You know, how do we, in, how, how do we, in, one of the things we saw was nobody was living downtown. You know, it, it would close at 5 p.m., you know. How do you get people to live downtown? Well, to kickstart it, um, we built student apartments downtown, right in the center on Street. We put 200 students right on Main Street. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a Portland Pie that opens across the street. You know, why? You know, the pizza and beer. Um, and uh, we, 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 we built a hotel in town. So there's all these different things, but it's really, I think it's, you know, looking at your strengths, looking at your weaknesses, really coming up with a specific plan, identifying what you can do. And, um, and, it's, and it's what Tom was saying, how do you draw people to a town? Well, you know, we were, we were in the same way, you know. How do you, how do you bring a professor to town um, who wants to live in that town if you're courting a professor? If you got parents that are, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at Bowdoin, they're looking at Bates, they're looking at Wesleyan, they're looking at, you know, all the different NASCAR schools through New England, you know. Um, so they're looking at these, all these different towns. What do, you, what do you do, how do you make those towns attractive so that people live there? And they want to live there, you know, restaurants, you want good restaurants, you want good public facilities, grounds, et cetera. You know, Waterville, like, uh, one of the strengths in Waterville was that it had a, um, it had a very strong arts and cultural um, base to it already. So, you know, we built upon that base. Um, so, it's so the, you know, you want a town where people want to live and they want to work. And if, you know, so that's, I think, you know, you bring all those different um, people together and come up with that. Excellent. Uh, no, thanks, Paul. And, and I know in some of our conversations, there's a lot of conversation about the, the start of this involved uh, both the institution of, of Colby, but also involved the community, in particular, uh, also the city of Waterville was, was part of that. Oh, huge, uh, huge. I mean, we were just, we were, believe, we're just one seat at the table and, uh, and, and an equal seat with everybody. And I have to tell you, it's, and I can't stress that enough, is that um, um, y you have to be an equal at the table and you have to listen. And, and that was really one of my jobs when I, um, when I, because uh, I was living in Portland and then I moved to Waterville. And uh, so, you know, people were, were a little leery. I mean, who's this guy, you know, coming to town? He's, you know, a Portland developer and blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of, you know, going in the local diners, going in, you know, the local pubs, talking to people, you know, talking to everybody in this sort, listening to what they have to say, you know, going into all the businesses downtown and listening to those concerns. And, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, making them part of the plan. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. The, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, moving from that to to a little bit over on the on the city side, uh, so we've got the assistant director of the economic development here with uh, with Misty Parker. Uh, Misty, what are some of the tools th that the city has at its disposal to assist developers? And uh, and I guess uh, we, we've got an audience for you to be able to ask them. Are there other things that maybe uh, that they uh, would be looking to the city to, to be able to offer as well. So maybe a little bit about what we do now uh, to try to attract some economic development. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, one of the things that we have heard is the amenities and investments. And I'm glad that Paul talked about the importance of planning because the city has done a remarkable job over the years planning for certain areas and then immediately following up with those investments incrementally to show that we are going to implement what we plan for and also to show uh, our development community and residents that yes, like this is happening. It's not just a plan that sits on there and we are committed to this vision so that others feel welcome in joining us in that. Um, we also recognize that, you know, in our market that sometimes it's challenging to make the numbers of development projects work and that you do need very creative, uh, challenging tools like historic tax credits to help. But also sometimes it doesn't come up, especially around residential. Um, residential is something that we've had a big interest in over the years, uh, especially downtown because, you know, we've been fortunate to have great restaurants uh, come in. 
um, and other different types of businesses, and we want the people to live here so that we also don't close up at 8, 9 o'clock. Uh, but um, so in order to do that, the city's been able to assist with uh, gap funding, and that's looked in a number of different ways. So uh, tax increment financing is usually the tool that we use. Uh, we've had a couple of projects on Lisbon Street that have not only used historic tax credits, but also used uh, TIFs to overcome some unique challenges that um, help make the project work. Uh, we also have other loan programs that we've been able to use, uh, whether it's through our community development block grant to help businesses fit out spaces or other funding sources that don't have those strings. Because uh, again, we know that sometimes your financing that you're gonna get um, isn't gonna fund the whole project and all of the creative tools, you just need just a little bit more. And so that's something that the city has been very good at working with folks on is really understanding what the numbers are for the project and how we can help in trying to find the right tool to make that project move forward. Um, in addition to that, sometimes we recognize that our zoning doesn't work completely for this. You know, the world is evolving, uh, development is changing, and sometimes what we established 10, 20 years ago for rules doesn't fit uh, new markets, new businesses. And so when we look at um, what a project is and what some of those challenges are and start talking to developers, and we look at what our comprehensive plan is, we see, oh, this is the type of use that we want here, this is the type of development, but there are certain things that prevent that from moving forward or make it more challenging than is necessary. And so our planning staff is remarkable at working to make those changes and do it quick. Because as Jim pointed out, developers are looking for a predictable environment and they don't want to take in on any unnecessary risk. And so um, in the past, we've worked with folks uh, to help make those changes where they make sense happen and happen quickly so that developers have that uh, predictability uh, to move forward with their projects. And the community is still assured that, yes, you're going to get the type of development that you were looking for when we did the comprehensive plan processing. It's just tweaking those rules to make sure that it works for today's environment. Excellent. Uh, and Mi Misty, if, if you had any uh, questions, I guess, in terms of are there things developers are looking for from, uh, from your department uh, that uh, n now would be the time to ask. <laughs> Absolutely. We always love to hear what these new challenges are and the role the city can play. So if there are thoughts that you guys have, let me know. Well, I was only going to chime on the first comment you made about the change of, of zoning, for example, the land use planning. And, and we, we happen to, with the Dominican block, uh, wanting to put, I think, 16 residential units on the upper floors there, the density was higher than what was allowed in that zone, even though in an urban area, and obviously the mills have much greater density than that uh, on a per square foot of land basis. So because it seemed like that was something that was a no-brainer that was also consistent with the comprehensive plan, we did work with the city uh, very effectively to modify that zone so that it would allow us to have the additional density. And of course, who doesn't want more housing? So um, I was just giving a little kind of pat on the back for the <laughs> fact that the city of Lewiston really did uh, work with us proactively and ensure us that, that we could get something like that done, and, and we did get that done. So. Excellent. I think the other challenge that's really out there, just and I'm sure it's going to come up today, but has anybody heard the word inflation lately? <coughs> Construction pricing right now has become very challenging for developers, um, and unfortunately it's causing certain projects that may be penciled out a year ago uh, no longer to, to be able to pencil out and get the, the return, and that's where I think you're kind of leading into that question is what do you do to try to fill that gap in financing to make a project viable. And, and that's, I, I think we're all can probably talk about lots of different challenges and projects that we're having where construction cost has gone up significantly over the last couple of years. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, I just saw an article yesterday, lumber prices are predicted to go up significantly again this summer. Um, so that's, that's becoming one of the real problems, I think, for continuing to, to develop both ground up and as well as, as renovations because it's not just material, it's, it's labor and material both. A absolutely, uh, Jim, and I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you folks face, and certainly I think the um, inflation rising uh, cost to borrow, as well as the construction costs and 
uh, and the availability of, of workforce uh, is, uh, is certainly something that, that we see in the market. Uh, so I'd be, be curious, I'll be asking all of you in your crystal ball what, what the uh, situation looks like in about a year here. But uh, I, I want to take a moment also, we, um, this is intended again as a, as a, a participatory exercise and so there are there is paper and I don't know if if we can uh, yes mayor and deputy mayor if you if you might circulate some of that for uh, for folks uh, if you do have questions we want to make sure you have the opportunity to write them down and uh, provide them to us uh, the next and so while, while that's going on we'll continue uh, some of our uh, conversations here uh, Tom uh, as as sort of a someone who's who's been through the development in uh, Lewiston. Wondering if, I know you gotta maintain your competitive edge, but, but uh, uh, wondering if you might share some, some of the lessons learned uh, that, y that you've experienced in this market that might be helpful for, for the other panelists. I, I think we all agree that uh, any development or all development helps each other, that, that it really grows uh, and so, Tom, I'll, I'll ask you, um, what, what are some of the things that you've found to be successful uh, in developing here in Lewiston? That's a tough one because almost every, uh, I find almost every project's different. Um, we tend not to do a lot of speculation. We generally take on a building, then find tenants, and then develop the building. So every tenant is a little different. Um, when we go after tenants that are from out of state, I think we have a huge advantage. We brought somebody in from California, and um, I was even apologetic at what we had to pay here for parking at $50 a month. But they were paying $600 a month out there. They thought it was nothing. Um, so we have a lot of things going for us. We have most people can come from another, even from Portland, and do business here uh, much more efficiently, much more economically. Um, I think uh, going back to NISTI, um, as we do projects, time is always huge. I mean, you have companies come in, and I'm sure you guys all have the same thing. You've sold them on it, now they want to move in next year, um, which is more like next year by the time you design and, and build. This city, and, and I've been doing this for a long time here, I don't think has ever put up a barrier to us doing a project. I mean, they've always found a way for us to do it. Our approvals are you know, two weeks, four weeks. I mean, I, I've taken them through Portland in a year and a half. Um, so, and that's important to businesses. Uh, w when they make up their decision to move, you've got to do it quickly, especially now, as, as Jim said, they might make their decision to come in now. And we have a project we just, we did in, in Maine that when we did it, it was $16 million. By the time the year went up and it went out to bid eight months ago, it was $22 million and it just can't be done. Um, and that's not uncommon when processes take a long time. Um, so that's probably, I think, one of the most important things we've learned. I mean, you've got to get the project moving, you got to get it done, you know, get the design get, get it built, um, make sure that with the Bates Mill particularly that we got the amenities in there. There was a lot of um, front money, and I guess Paul would say we're crazy because we did put in a lot and not have any returns. Um, to getting it to be a place that people want to be, whether it's walkways, art, artwork, um, what's that? Food so oh, I thought it was. Oh, all right. Yeah. Um, it's Alexa answering. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, pre preparing, especially, you know, the, the mill's got over a million square feet, and if you're putting somebody into 10,000, they don't want to be there all alone and with no amenities. So. You know, preparing your projects, um, th those are just a few of the things. I think everyone is a little different, but I won't beat the point. You know, there's a, uh, there's a saying in real estate that time kills deals, and it does. I think, uh, and, and I think that, that uh, pressure curve has spiked here uh, in the recent, recent past, so, uh, so, um, no, I appreciate that, Tom. Uh, spe speaking of the uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet in, in these mills, I told Matt that I was going to put him on the spot here and talk about what, uh, what ideas, uh, hopes, dreams they have for uh, the Continental and Hill Mills as they, uh, 
uh, have now acquired those assets and uh, and look to convert those. So, uh, what's your what's your blue sky thinking, Matt? Sure, and and uh, I guess I'll start with the hill mill because that's a little bit easier. It has it has a nice um, uh, number of commercial tenants who occupy the building today, and it's stable and it's something that probably in the moment can can remain a nice incubator space for for businesses here in, in Lewiston. Um, the Continental Mill is the one that's along the river. It has 600,000 square feet. Uh, it has an interesting courtyard. It's it's almost an entire donut. Uh, so to Tom's point, one of the features that we are uh, blue sky thinking about is this courtyard, which presently kind of feels very uninviting because it's paved and it's uh, six stories of brick around it. So creating, making that into a, a green courtyard space uh, will be an awesome amenity for the residents and businesses that move into the Continental Mill. Uh, so that's front and center in our, in our planning. Um, similarly, we have hopes for a, a I mean, if Eric Jimberg was here, he'd like to say we're gonna have a roof deck on the building. So we're gonna find a way to put a <laughs> roof deck on the building. We've done that in a couple of projects that would look out towards the river and have that west facing view. And then lastly, there's the nice riverfront property. Well, granted, there's elevation change from the, uh, the property to the river, but making that somehow more active um, for our residents and for the community. We, we have talked to the city about connecting a community path along the property there. So we, we know that outdoor spaces uh, really are uh, need to be activated because residents want to spend time outside. Uh, and lastly, our apartment buildings tend to, to make the numbers work with the rising costs. Uh, we oftentimes find that we do a fair number of smaller apartments. And this is a trend not just for us, it's across the country. So you have smaller studios and one bedrooms and two bedrooms. And as a result, you know, creating community spaces within inside the building and also outside the building is very important. So the 600,000 square feet of space, we have plenty of canvas to, 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 uh, to design to and plan with. Excellent. No, I, th I think that's uh, that's exciting. So if uh, if those are f folks out here who want, want all those amenities of living close to uh, uh, walkable distance to restaurants and and walking paths along the river, uh, we can we can kind of can keep an eye eyes open on the Continental Mill and what that might might provide. Could I Misty, actually yeah, add to that? Please. So um, you know we hear a lot from you guys that uh, your tenants are looking for amenities and that we do have parks and things like that. Um, that is a really great example, though, about the bike paths. So the city has been working in the riverfront area for many years, doing different paths, connecting along the riverfront, making sure that residents have access to the riverfront, and trying to find ways to continue that on so it's not just a very short distance. Uh, but in order to do so, it has to go across private property. And so partnering with Chimberg at the Continental Mill, we're able to build a public path that will help connect to existing paths at Samard Payne Park, connect over to Auburn, um, and be accessible to everyone, while also being a very attractive amenity for those that are gonna live at the Continental Mill. But we couldn't do it without that type of partnership. Thank you, uh, Misty. In, and uh, playing on the idea of partnerships, a uh, question to, uh, to the developers. Uh, what is it that area employers can do to help support uh, further investment? Fe folks that are already here, that have businesses here, uh, what what can they do to help uh, grow the uh, uh, investments in the local economy here in Lewiston? Uh, and I'll start maybe with uh, Tom. I think certainly the larger businesses could encourage their employees to live and work here. Um, I think for too long, so many of the people that work here don't live here. Uh, and that would, you know, when I look at the hospitals and the law firms and just everybody who works in this town makes their living in this town, excuse me, in this town, but then at five o'clock it's gone. Um, it would just make a tremendous um, uh, uplift to, to what happens here at night, to money that's spent here, to the restaurants. Uh, I mean, I think we have the amenities to serve them if they would stay around and use them. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll, we'll go right down the line here. Uh, Jim, thoughts on on how uh, the local businesses can help support support you folks? And yeah, I, I don't think of it as much as helping us as the developer. Maybe is helping the community, and if the community is doing well, then the developer is going to do fine. I think, as Tom said earlier, and as I said, we're going to we're going to follow where the market is. 
and you know I've w within our hotel businesses in Portland we you know donate uh, significantly to a lot of the nonprofit organizations in town that do all kinds of things to build great community and so I think what what can businesses do in a community is support their own community yeah. and and that's probably the best thing they can do that will actually generate more economic opportunity for new businesses to want to come here and for new residences to want to uh, people to want to live here full time. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Matt? Sure. Um, we've, we've been involved in a couple of communities here in Maine where they have very active Main Street organizations that do a lot of community outreach through programming, uh, artwork. I can't say enough about what artwork does, public art does for a community. And that has, we've found that just to be super inviting and a wonderful way to attract residents. Paul, and, and uh, kind of thinking about that uh, from the perspective of, of uh, some of the businesses that have been at the table in the conversations in, in Waterville, uh, and uh, what were some of the um, ways in which uh, the development uh, areas that you, you folks have been involved in have uh, leveraged some of the goodwill of the of community businesses in, uh, in, the, in the Main Street area in Waterville? I think I think you really need to be a good listener. Um, you know, you can't be aloof in this process. When you're when you're, I know one of the one of the major projects actually was separate um, from the building developments that we did downtown was. Um, the changing of Main Street. Main, Main Street is currently was is it's a one-way street, um, and it was I think it was uh, it was two-way back in the 50s, and then they changed it to way, uh, changed it to one way. <clears throat> so everybody who was on Main Street in Waterville, um, driving through the center of town, nobody was stopping in town. They were going to Winslow. They're going to the coast. They're going everywhere. There. And so one of the keys to us was okay, you know. How do we how do we how do we make Main Street a pedestrian friendly town, a shopping district town, and how do we divert that traffic around the outskirts of the town so that the cars that are going down are shopping downtown? Um, luckily, um, we applied for a federal grant, what's called a build grant, um, and uh, we got it to the tune of ten million dollars. That. Um, allowed us to do various, uh, you know, improvements to, you know, direct the traffic. But during that process, one of the, what the, what the, the businesses downtown, you know, one of their biggest concerns were, was parking and loading and unloading. Mm -hmm. um, because there was diagonal parking on the streets that just didn't work and, you know, Three quarters of Waterville's population drives around in an F-250 with a, you know, an eight-foot bed, so it's halfway out into the street. Um, so you know, we had to get rid of that diagonal parking and go to parallel. So we lost X amount of spaces. So, <clears throat> and then the loading and unloading question: How do you how do you address that? Where at one point when traffic was going on one direction, a tractor trailer could pull over and somebody just scoots around it. Now all of a sudden they can't do that. You know, so it's it's it was you know once again I think it's listening to the you know it's listening to the constituents, talking to them and and coming up with you know solutions to these problems. Um, and as Matt was saying, um, uh, you know the, the Main Street programs that I don't know if Lewiston has a Main Street program or not. Waterville had one up to actually a couple years ago, and then the city stopped funding it. Um, but those are very important programs too, to you know, to bring you know vitality to the downtown. And but you know, having that forum where the local businesses could all get together themselves and talk and exchange ideas, um, you know, your local chamber of commerce, how they you know how they facilitate those discussions, um, you know, extremely important. Yeah. No. Uh and, and sp speaking of, of listening, I think uh, to, the, to the community, this is this is really one of the most important parts of, of why uh, we decided to have this as a public forum tonight. 
Uh, and so I want to take this now as an opportunity. I, I know that the mayor is, uh, is, is collating through some of these questions. Carl, do we have, uh, we have a few questions here? We might start to uh, integrate some of the conversation that's in the uh, minds of those here tonight. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to see how many of them have mill number five on, on the uh, topic here. No, Tom, you're <laughs> off the hook. Uh, so uh, given the anticipated improving uh, or improved conditions, increased value of properties in Lewiston, are there any strategies in place to reduce gentrification? And that's in order to maintain the benefits for low-income community members while still attracting new investment uh, and, and profits and yields. Um, and so I think, I think there's a sort of that aspect of, of the tension inherently in, in uh, making sure that projects pencil out that they, that they uh, make economic sense, but at the same time, how do we balance that with uh, the need for affordable places uh, for our citizens to live? And so um, I guess uh, uh, I'll put it out to, to maybe Matt, I'll start, start with you and, and uh, this aspect of uh, how do we integrate affordability with uh, without all the bad aspects of, uh, of gentrification that sometimes come sure. with development? Sure. Um, well, our company is primarily focused on building market rate housing, and that's this term like affordable housing that is complicated and not really precise in what that means. Um, but market rate uh, means generally the residents who live in the buildings are making between 80% and 120% of the area median income. Uh, and uh, we find that oftentimes that market rate uh, is in the 80 to 100% range. And we've done projects uh, where uh, groups that support affordable housing uh, support our projects. We have a project in Dover, New Hampshire right now where we have a loan f um, from an a mission-driven lender that mission is to create affordable housing. Um, and the 80% the, uh, range is right at the cusp of what you might hear the term workforce housing. I, I think folks who know more than I do would say that that's, that would be considered workforce housing. And I think folks would also agree that that is framed as affordable housing that's generally uh, in the f a household making, I think, between fifty and $60,000, probably in those parts of, um, of uh, the areas that we're in, from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, up, up to Portland. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that we do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is we make, uh, uh, we have to do smaller apartments. That's kind of how the math works to make the, the construction costs uh, spread out over more units and, 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 and uh, more rentable space. As a result, those smaller units, a studio, can be very affordable. Uh, we have studios in our portfolio that rent for 1,100 bucks, 1,200 bucks a, a month, um, which, which would equate to if that's a third of someone's income, uh, which is the rule of thumb that is generally out there. Uh, I'm not going to do the math that well in my head that quickly, but. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, it's probably in, in the low forty thousand dollars per year range, um, which, when when I drive down Main Street in my town, I see signs up on the street for many of the service businesses that are advertising for uh, um, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty dollars uh, an hour, which would be that forty thousand dollar income. So, um, right size units and units that are market rate tend to help work towards affordability. Uh, M Misty, you have, yeah. have some thoughts on this. I know, I know you've been involved in quite a bit of uh, some of conversations as of late with respect to uh, some of these issues of... Yeah, no, it's something that the community has paid um, a lot of attention to, especially as we talk about new development. And it, I just want to say that I don't think it's one thing that one developer can solve on their own. Uh, it really does need to be a collaborative effort to look at how the community is developing and what the community needs. Um, so that's something we've been paying attention to, especially um, with the city receiving the Choice Neighborhood Grant to redevelop the Tree Street. Uh, that came out a lot. Um, this great, we need new housing here, but is there going to be a place for the people who live there or are they going to get pushed out? 
Um, we actually, you know, we talk about that in the riverfront. We talk about that on Lisbon Street and just wanting to ensure that there is a place for everyone. Uh, and, you know, just watching uh, the redevelopment of Portland. I think often we look to Portland as a success, but over the years we've seen all of a sudden the folks that need to work there can't afford to live there. And that's become a big challenge for the businesses they are. And so as we look to redeveloping, trying to be proactive in how we plan is really critical. Uh, so we've had a number of different types of affordable housing development um, in the downtown come together. So one will be um, actually at the Continental Mill, but in a separate part of the mill building in the center. Uh, that's a partnership with the Zanting Company, who would do be doing uh, mixed income workforce housing. And so there's uh, affordability levels uh, preserved into the development at uh, different income levels. Uh, we have that also at the Bates Mill Complex too, because again, we're inviting all of these businesses here that are really critical to our community. We wanna make sure that we have the workers that are able to benefit from the jobs created in the mills. And so that was another one that Zantin partnered with uh, and the same with the Hartley Block here on Lisbon Street. So again, another mixed income development um, that's not just market rate, but also has some of those workforce units as well. Uh, throughout the community, we've seen a number of different strategies to uh, raise up housing cooperative. Uh, they have um, their housing co-op that has created some affordability for people at different levels um, to make sure that, again, you can kind of preserve the affordable units as well as still having those unrestricted units. So as the neighborhood changes, uh, there's a place for everyone. And also through uh, some of the tools that the city has to assist residential development through a community development block grant program or through um, our home program, our lead abatement program, a portion of the units in that building that w the city puts money in to help make that work happen requires an affordability period for 80% of the area median income or below. So again, more workforce um, housing for a certain period of time. And so that way it's not um, committing forever, but for a period of time that is gonna ensure that those units can stay accessible to people here. So it takes a lot of different tools um, and a lot of different types of developers to look at um, what's gonna work long term because we can't predict what's gonna look like in 10 years, but we can be proactive to try and make sure that there's the housing types that everyone's gonna need then depending on how the market goes. I don't know if, if any of the other panelists, before we move on, on to another subject, any, any more thoughts in, in terms of uh, the diversity of uh, housing types in that, uh, that it really are an important part of making um, any community a, a healthy uh, community uh, economically? Well, I think probably just to piggyback on what Misty's saying, um, to really embrace affordable housing, the city, state, and federal government have to be involved. Um, the only, there's, there's really no way any of us as developers can build an apartment complex and truly um, serve the underserved. The margins on these things, especially now with the cost of building, are so tight. I mean, I know it looks like somebody does a $25 million project, they must have all kinds of money to throw around. But the truth is, you know, they have $3.5 million in debt service, if, if your income is $100,000 uh, less than your expenses, you're not making money. So you really, that doesn't mean the developers can't work with the cities and because we have ways. You don't really want us to just do affordable housing on our own because it won't be good housing because you'll have to really skimp and use, you know, it'll be, it just won't be quality housing. So what you want to do is work with us so that we can get programs and we're happy to bring them into the projects. Um. Yeah, th thank you, and as, as that, uh, as Tom, you were, you were uh, talking about that, a qu question came up that uh, I think is kind of an interesting one in terms of uh, determining the need for, for housing at certain rent price points, and how do you, uh, how do you determine what the need for housing is, uh, and um, is, it, is it build it and they will come, or is there a more calculated approach to 
uh, establishing you know where, where you enter the market. Uh, Jim, do you want to take a stab at, at that? Yeah, and, and, and again, we're not the big residential developer compared to the two gentlemen on both of my sides. We're more in the hospitality space and, and uh, love to do unique buildings. And we felt like the Dominican block was a unique opportunity, a beautiful building, and felt that the highest and best use was housing. If we were trying to do 100 units, you know, we would have gone out and done an extensive market study and try to really understand what we thought the, the right price point was for you know, the studio, the one bedroom, the two bedroom, what the demand was for those different unit types. But because we were limited to something more like 16 units that we can fit into that building, in essence, we didn't go do that. We just said, you know, do we think we can develop this building into some high quality finishes that last um, and, and generate a rent that we think can actually justify paying the debt service and paying a yield to the investors? And so we took a little bit of a leap of faith and uh, believe that we can create a product that's unique in this marketplace um, and, um, and hope that it works um, without going and doing an extensive study, which if, again, if we were doing hundreds of units, we would have gone that route. And we don't develop hotels without going that route either, <laughs> uh, you know, with an extensive market feasibility study to, to determine what we think the average daily rate and the occupancy might be for that given marketplace. But I think just touching a little bit more on the the challenges, and I absolutely agree with Tom, you know, it takes not just the city, but the state with, you know, low income housing tax credits that come from the federal government as well. And there's some new, there's some new programs that are being talked about at the state level now uh, that are going to generate about $70,000 per unit, I believe, uh, that are going to be deed restricted for affordable to help projects like this kind of fill that gap and, and be able to create more affordable housing. So I think it's become such a sensitive topic in people's uh, front of people's minds about the cost of hou rising housing here in the state of Maine that everybody's really focused on how do we try to solve that. Um, and I can tell you one of the ways you don't solve it, which is what's happening actually in Port right, Portland right now, is they instituted what's called inclusionary zoning, which says if you build a certain number of units, X number of those units need to be affordable. And through a referendum that passed, it's the the deal now is you 25% of your units need to be affordable at the 80% of the AMI level. And the challenge is that it, it's one thing to kind of call it, I'm going to call it hit the developer with the stick, but if you hit them with the stick, you also need to give them a carrot. And what's happening in Portland is that if you create a, a requirement for so much affordable housing that they can't generate the income to be able to pay the debt service, then they just won't do the project you can't get the investment capital. So right now, the number of building permits that have been pulled in Portland for new housing since that referendum passed some 12 months ago, zero. So while you think you're trying to solve a problem, it sounds great, build 25% more affordable housing units. What's happened, you won't get any new supply. And actually what happens is you will exacerbate the housing problem because I'm a big believer in supply and demand. And the demand isn't going away, but if the supply doesn't come, then the cost of housing is actually going to go up. And I'm not saying inclusionary zoning is wrong, and I testified for it the first time when they passed it at 10%, but said you've got to be able to provide the carrot, whether it's through a TIF or some other means to try to help make that up so that the developer can actually earn a reasonable return and they will build the project, because otherwise you've just stymied the development overall. And there are people in Portland right now saying, geez, it's gotten so bad, we need to create, there, there's a group now pushing for 50% inclusionary housing. Don't you get it? Zero times 25% is zero, and zero times 50% is still zero. <laughs> we, we just had to convince all those uh, folks to, to come on up, up here. We've got lots of opportunity in, <laughs> and, uh, in our city. Uh, one of the questions uh, asked, uh, the challenges of distressed buildings uh, in, uh, in these communities, and uh, and what what are those uh, uh, what are those uh, aspects of, of building or, or renovating historic buildings are the the real challenges, and and what are the what's the other side of that? What's the satisfaction of, of undertaking a project like that? And so maybe Tom, I'll start start with you. Well, the challenges are numerous. Um, you know, these buildings were built in the 1860s, most of the Bates Mill, um, but they're beautiful buildings. I think the fact that they're still standing 
actually speaks to what kind of shape they're in, even if they look a little ragged. Um, but we've learned a lot over the years as we, as we renovate them. I think um, for the most part, uh, especially in the beginning when we started, it was much more economical to renovate than it was to build new. Um, now with the prices where they're at, it's probably similar. It might be a little cheaper only in that we're not doing foundations and exterior walls. Um, but the challenges are if you, and we mostly are trying to historically um, restore them, uh, is the craftsmanship it takes, especially on the exterior of the buildings, the, the brick work, you know, rebuilding arches, rebuilding uh, capitals, just all the detail that was done back in the 1800s is a lot harder to get done today. Um, the plus side is, as I said, these bills, mills are really solid. I mean, the floor loading is, in some cases, greater than we even require today. We've got places in the Bates Mill that were built to 450 pounds a square foot, which is way over what anything we need. Um, you know, the timbers, everything, most of it's in good shape. We do go through and reinforce a lot of it. The, uh, most of it's water damage, where these mills were abandoned. The roof, when we went into the mills, um, in a rainstorm, I'm not sure you would have stayed drier outside. Um, it was really pouring through. I'm sure Lincoln remembers that. Um, but uh, again, they're all challenges. They're all very rewarding when you go into one of these mills after we've restored it. And you can see, get a pretty good glimpse of what it looked like in 1860 uh, with a different workforce, uh, with the same number of people. I mean, our goal at Bates has always been to bring the, the workforce back up to over 5,000, which is what it was in its heyday. Uh, so that's the reward. Uh, and it's fun to do these projects. Jim, you want to take a crack yeah, at that? Yeah, I've done, I've done a few historic uh, tax credit rehab projects as well. I think I've done three of them, uh, nowhere near the scale of what uh, Tom and, and Matt have done. But, um, you know, I think that you're right, that with the benefit of the federal uh, being at 20% and the state of Maine uh, historic tax credit at 25% of the qualified rehabilitative expenses, usually it's still more cost effective to renovate an existing historic building than it is to build ground up. But there are challenges that come with it. And one of the ones, uh, you know, certainly agree, Tom, Tom knows more about it than I do, um, challenges with the structural or masonry and things like that. But one of the differences I found is the efficiency. So the, the mills were designed to be extremely efficient at what they did, but now we're changing the uses. And we have very different codes now for where the stair needs to be and how close it needs to be to certain distances and the widths of the stairs and where the elevator cores are. And so all of a sudden, you might have built a new building that has 15, 20, 25% less square footage to build than taking and creating the same exact thing inside an existing mill. And so those historic tax credits oftentimes are used not just to deal with maybe a building that was in very tough condition, but the fact you have a lot more square footage that you need to renovate just because the building isn't efficiently designed as a square footage for the use that you're doing. So I think that's one of the other challenges that you, you likely see. Okay. We've run into that, I know. Excellent. Uh, Jim, uh, Matt, Matt, you have thoughts on, on this? You guys have done a number of, uh, of older historic properties. It's, yeah, I've worked on a couple of this while my colleagues here were, were sp speaking, but they've said most of them already. Um, uh, Tom mentioned one, which is rot repair, and and uh, when you have a large property like the Bates Mill and like Continental Mill, you never know the, everything that's underneath the, the the wood underneath the ground. Um, so the unknown is is the biggest biggest risk, and that unknown is is the rot repair. Uh, that unknown is is uh, environmental hazardous materials that need to be removed. Um, so those costs are gut punch <laughs> when you're doing a project because uh, you always plan for a contingency in your budget, but if, if you want to, you're hoping that contingency p pays for that new cool roof deck that Mr. Chimberg wants not to take care of uh, rotten timbers. Um, so the, the unknown and, and that is what makes us nervous, but boy, walking through a building after it's done and seeing and knowing how long it takes to get there and, and also just, uh, the mills have such a story in the community. Everybody knows someone whose parents or grandparents 
her uncles worked in the mill at one point in its history. It's so satisfying. And they don't happen overnight. None of these projects happen overnight. Another good saying in, in real estate, uh, to echo off what Paul said er earlier, time does kill deals, but every deal dies a thousand deaths before it becomes reality. <laughs> so to get to the end zone and to have scored that touchdown and be done is pretty awesome. Excellent. I, yeah, yeah, Paul, guess, you got some thoughts on? on yeah, that? just I, I guess um, you know some of the properties that I've done down to one of the properties that we renovated downtown was actually the oldest building on Main Street in Waterville. It was uh, constructed in 1840, um, <clears throat> and uh, and similar. It w this was a building where half of it there was a fire in the building. The roof was you know left open, and water just poured through it. But uh, any of these renovations is you know the things that these fellows would say, and you know the asbestos in the buildings, these old buildings, um, floor tiles, all those things. The other challenges are on these old buildings is um, is just column layout when you're when you're designing a space you're always you know you're always fighting where the columns are in the building how this is when you know uh, somebody had talked about you know maybe we could build this building for you know a certain amount of apartments if we built it it'd be 30,000 square feet but in that we need to have 50,000 square feet to do it in the mill, and it's and it all gets back to column layout. So, and I echo what they said about masonry. The other one that always that that catches you a lot is the roof. Um, where is the floor loading uh, on these older mills and these older buildings is great. Um, uh, the roofs aren't necessarily the same, and your current structural codes, because of snow loading, you usually have to you usually have to completely redo all the structural on the roof, or at least beef up the existing roof substantially. And God knows what the actual roof is made of, also, you know, with the old built-up asphalt roofs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, there's there's a there's there's a lot of exposure and there's uh, uh, when they're done they're beautiful but there's there's a lot of additional extra costs. One of the uh, questions we're switching gears a little bit here uh, asks uh, what what the role of um, cultivating local phil philanthropic uh, causes in, in a community can play and, and and Paul is sort of thinking about about the role that it played in. Uh, in the development uh, of, of Waterville, uh, sometimes it's it's a large uh, uh, interest, and sometimes it can be a smaller. Um, thinking also, I think there are comments about public art and uh, the investment yeah. that that can yield in a community, uh, the visibility of that. Uh, and so, I'll start, start with Paul, and then maybe uh, Tom can follow up on some of the things that that he sees in the public art realm here in Lewiston. So, Paul, how how has it worked in in Waterville, uh, and uh, are there any lessons learned? Well, it's you know what I what I spoke about earlier. Um, you know, there 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 are always those members of the community. There are always those benefactors in a community that um, are willing to step up um, to the plate to contribute. Um, you know, financially to these you know to these projects to make them happen. Um, I don't know who they are in Waterville, um, but I'm sure every community has them. Um, you know, I I don't want to put Bates College on the line here. You know, um, but you know how what what role potentially you know could Bates play in this whole process? How could they you know assist the city? I know with all of the properties that we develop downtown, you know Colby made a commitment to the town that we would not take any um, we would not take any property off of the tax rolls. Um, actually, Colby created. Um, LLCs, uh, limited liability companies, on all of the properties that we bought, so that we, you know, would maintain those tax rolls, which was important to the members of the community. So, you know, once again, I don't know who the benefactors are here in Lewiston, but um, I'm sure they're out there. Uh, absolutely, and if, if they're here tonight, please come forward. But uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Tom, just a, a little bit thinking about, uh, about some of the uh, investment that uh, comes out of uh, uh, voluntary uh, organizations, but or others stepping forward to make an investment uh, in in, uh, in our landscape. 
Yes, some actually some great things have been happening in Auburn and Lewiston uh, in terms of culture and art. Uh, we've recently started a started as a sculpture trail. I think it'll be more of an art trail, um, but we certainly have. Misty, you can correct me on numbers, but maybe a half a dozen or so sculptures that have already been installed. Uh, I know we've installed three or four in the mill in the last 24 months. Uh, we have plans for a major one on Main Street in the coming year. Um, so those are all things that will hopefully draw people to the community. But there are other organizations. I mean, you have the Public Theater, the Community Little Theater. You have the Franco Center. Um, Maine Music puts on some incredible programs. We need all these things, and I think all these organizations uh, come together to, to entice people to come to our community. And kind of back at one of the original questions, and I think Jim alluded to this, local businesses should support these organizations. That's what will continue the building of this. Oh, I, yeah, I do have a few things to add to this. Um, so I would say on the public art piece, we have the Downtown Lewiston Association who fundraised uh, for the beautiful um, bird mural that's on Main Street now. They just uh, had it installed last year. But again, it was local businesses downtown recognizing the value of public art, working with a local business owner, uh, a local building owner on uh, use of their wall space, fundraising for an artist to come and do that. Um, so without them doing that type of uh, project, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, we also have the Downtown Lewiston Association who uh, recognize, and there's a couple people that uh, are in this room that were part of it, but I won't call them out, recognize the need for uh, holiday lights, uh, more of them, and beautiful spheres that you see in Dufresne Plaza. Uh, they worked with the city to say, how can we make this happen? Recognize um, the need to privately fundraise some of the funds for that um, and organize that fundraising effort, went out, knocked on doors, um, helped put up an online donation system. And so now we have a growing number of uh, holiday lights throughout Lisbon Street and especially in the Dufresne Plaza area that um, is just an, a, a beautiful addition, especially during our darkest months. Um, for philanthropy and investment in development, um, you know, at the beginning of this, Paul had mentioned, you know, the role that Colby took on in Waterville because at the time, private developers wouldn't play that role. And so you have a university that stepped into it and um, recognized the need. Uh, we've actually had a similar thing happen with our choice neighborhood work in the Tree Street. Uh, where we recognize the need for trying to do significant investment that can be a catalyst for uh, more change in that neighborhood. We had a foundation that helps that stepped up with some initial uh, investment into that project to acquire um, the properties that uh, we would be needing to redevelop, worked with the Genesis Foundation to manage that investment so that our uh, Lewis and Housing could acquire, their development corp could acquire those sites um, at a reasonable rate and um, pre essentially create that foundation. But a private developer at the time would not have done what they did, but recognizing we need a catalyst, here's an opportunity, so how can we have um, some creative uh, funders come in that see the bigger picture, that can wait a longer time for that return and uh, set the stage for that. Uh, we're getting close to the end here, and so uh, uh, one of the last questions I'll ask our panelists uh, is uh, two, two things. One, looking into crystal ball, what do you see the challenges that are going to be ahead of us for the next, in the next uh, 12 to 24 months? But I don't want you to, to end on that. I want you to say what, what, are, the, what are the opportunities, what, what are the bright spots uh, in that horizon as well? Uh, and so... Uh, we'll start uh, uh, down. Into we, st we started the whole thing with Tom. I think we'll start. Uh, so we're going to go to to uh, uh, Matt. Uh, and uh, what do you see from from the developer's seat uh, as challenges and uh, and where are the opportunities? Where are the bright spots? Okay. The the, the challenges we um, I think Jim brought it up. Inflation, 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 and, and rising interest rates. Um, but so that's that's front and center, making difficult projects work when you have those additional costs stacked against you. It only makes it more difficult. 
one thing I didn't mention before, you asked about challenges in doing these projects, this is the boring part of it, but uh, coming up with what we call the capital stack of the loans and the grants and the mission-driven lenders and the sponsor equity, um, you have to sometimes find an extra source, as uh, someone mentioned, and you can't make it work. So that's a challenge that we'll, we'll have. Um, the opportunities are clear. It's, it's we, we all here love historic buildings. We love active downtowns like Lewiston has. So there's upside, and uh, uh, we know that uh, eventually projects get done. So just you know, keeping your head down and working hard, uh, we'll have wonderful things to say about the projects we completed here in a couple of years. Excellent. Very good. Jim, we're, we're, what are we going to see here? Yeah, I think you know the challenge is definitely um, you know construction cost today, and 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 that that's I, I as some people have said cons things like that go up like a up like an arrow and down like a feather, and so while I'd love to cross my fingers and say oh this is going to be over in six months or twelve months and we'll be able to get the construction cost back down to where we need it, I, I think that's highly unlikely. I think we're going to be looking for more ways to fill that capital stack, uh, the gap in the capital stack to be able to make some of these projects work, um, i.e. through grants or TIFs and things like that that, that can make them work. Um, so I think that's really the one of the biggest challenges is, is um, the cost of construction and of course with what's been happening on a macroeconomic level, I think we're all anticipating continued interest rate rises coming rather than the other way around to combat inflation. So that, of course, makes deals harder to finance as well. So I think those are the two biggest challenges I see. I think as far as opportunities, um, you know, in a lot of ways, COVID um, made people recognize that places like Maine is a pretty nice place to live. And so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of people moving to the state of Maine and places like Lewiston. I don't know exactly what the numbers were here in Lewiston, but we certainly have seen it a lot in, in the Portland community where I am as well. Uh, for demand for housing and and new jobs and, and uh, new opportunities being created there, so I see that as the bright sign uh, for what for what's to come here for Maine. And so hopefully more and more people recognize this is a great place to live, work, and play. So bring them on. Excellent. And Tom, thoughts on that subject? Yeah, not to reiterate too much, but building costs are number one. I think those that's really going to be problematic over the next couple of years. Uh, that and labor availability. We're finding on jobs that you, know, you used to think you could get them done in six months, but you can't even get subs. I mean, they just go on forever. Uh, I'm not quite as worried about interest rates. I think we can probably work with them, um, but then I come from someone and we built our office building. We closed at uh, six, 17 and a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they go up and down. We, I think we can, uh, we can probably deal with that. Um, I think on the plus side, this community has just so much going for it. I mean, we are, again, north of Portland. It's an easier community to get things through, to get things done. We have uh, the, these two cities have, and you can correct me, Mr. almost 100 square miles, something like that. I think Auburn's about 65 and you're 35. I mean, we have an ample amount of land. We have the opportunity for downtown housing. We have the opportunity for those who want to live in the woods. Uh, we have water. We have parks. Uh, I think we're in a really good position right now. I think it's as expensive as things are. It's still cheaper to do them up here. Um, I think the city is bends over backwards to make things happen, um, even parking. Um, it uh, well, I mean, it, it's it's probably what got the Bates Mill started. I mean, we had people come here who had come from Portland looking to get 50,000 square feet in Portland. And, you know, they were told they could get maybe 50 parking spaces. Come to Lewiston and it's taken care of. Um, so we have a lot going for us. And uh, I'm a actually very optimistic. Excellent. Uh, last uh, word tonight, Missy, we'll reserve for you here. And uh, so uh, what is it that, that you want to spread the message uh, regarding um, economic development here in the in the city of Lewiston, not necessarily to the, the folks that are here, uh, but to all those developers out there who have yet to make the investment in Lewiston. What, what is it that we can message them and what, what you want to share uh, with all those? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I'm hopeful that people have heard from our panel tonight that uh, Lewiston is a really good place to do business. Uh, that you have an environment that um, is predictable, even in the harshest time when construction costs and labor are not predictable, at least on the city side, we do our part. Our goal is, is to set the stage uh, so that we can just get out of the way and let you guys do what you do well. Um, we want to make sure that it is a good place uh, for you to do business. We also are realistic and know how challenging it can be to make these projects work, even in the best of times, and that you know there is a partner there that we will work with you and figure out how to uh, get these projects done, especially when they add so much value to the community, uh, whether it's new amenities or uh, types of new businesses that people have been craving to see. Um, so we're always available, um, you know, our offices, uh, whether it's planning or economic development, we're on the third floor of City Hall and uh, folks are always welcome to come and talk about their projects. We also work with developers early on, people when they have ideas um, at the very early stages so that we can start those conversations, troubleshoot with folks um, and identify what those issues are before you get to the point where you're ready to acquire the property and wanna move forward so that it can be as uh, effortless as possible. So we are, uh, we do what we can to be a good partner and um, are always open to the feedback about what we can be doing to try and make this a better environment for you to do your business. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming uh, tonight. Thank you for caring ab about Lewiston. Thank you to our panelists and, and their investments that they've made uh, in our city uh, and appreciate everyone's uh, thoughts uh, and expressions here and uh, uh, and uh, hopefully you can all see the, the bright spots in the future as well. Uh, Mayor Shaleen, would you like to say a few closing words? I just really want to thank everyone for coming and a huge round of applause for uh, Mark Lee and the panel. Thank you. Uh, tonight's concluded, so uh, I know the panelists will be uh, lingering here as they head to the door, so if you have any questions or uh, want to uh, ask them anything, uh, certainly make uh, make your moves now. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.